Welcome back to the 57th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including one that talks about the dangers of facial recognition and how private enterprise is using it in the United States. The second one talking about antitrust bills that have been stalling and the reason for that hint Chuck Schumer is a little bit biased and our last article talks about the opportunity that is opening up in the Arctic though climate change may be bad it's changing the geopolitical sphere and it's something that we need to pay attention to going into the future and of course we will end today with our daily delight a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump into our daily debate. So as we look at the world stage, more and more people have looked to China. They've been growing, they've been expanding, and there's no doubt that they deserve a little bit of attention. A lot of questions need to be asked. How do they get to where they are? And One of the things that they've done is they've opened up their economy, but they've kept a lot of their social policy very stringent, to put it lightly. They're an authoritarian country, so some people look to them as an example as to what to do in order to thrive, survive, and possibly have America come back out on top. Uh, There's a famous quote from a national security expert, and I feel terrible that I can't remember her name. But she said, in order to beat China, we have to become more like China. Well, guess what? China is a socialist, authoritarian country with a centralized, planned economy. Even though it is more open to free trade, it doesn't mean that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't have their hands in everything. And they are very authoritarian with the way that they rule their people using facial recognition, social scores, so on and so forth. So when I hear comments like that from foreign advi- foreign policy advisors and internal policy advisors, you know, it, it brings a little bit of trepidation. It makes me a little bit scared. So... Some have looked to them as an illustration of what we shouldn't do. There are those who say, no, 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 we cannot go down this path. We cannot slip this way. And I would have to come down on that side if, I, if I'm displaying my, my bias. But the reason I bring all this up is because of the technology that they use, like facial recognition software and the policy of having a centralized digital currency Both of them are being explored and, in some cases, used here in the United States. So my question to you is, is there a way to do it right? Or does any path, including these technologies and policies, end in an authoritarian regime that limits the freedom of its participants or the citizens of that system? And I would love to hear your comments on this one because I think it's a very interesting conversation. And of course, there can be things that we can learn from any successful society. But when they are diametrically opposed, or at least the values of that society are diametrically opposed to ours, I don't necessarily know if there's value, or at least things that we can use directly. Maybe things that we can take as an example and then flip it around apply it in a more freedom-centric, more democratic way, sure. But I don't think there's many things that we can take exactly the way they do it, like their COVID tracking, their relentless oppression of people that disagree with the the government. I don't really see <laughs> that ever being implemented in a good way. All right, I spent a little bit more time than normal on the day, this daily debate, but I think it's an important question, and I'm very curious especially as I've been seeing these articles, I want to hear what other people have to say because maybe I'm in a bubble. Maybe some people do want the safety that some of these technologies bring and the accountability for their neighbor that some of these programs bring. Maybe I'm just too young and naive to see the bigger picture and to understand the implications of such things. All right, let's jump to our first article from Common Dreams. Calls for the U.S. facial recognition ban grow after mom booted from theater over her job. So this article really ties into the daily debate because this 
similar software is what the CCP uses to monitor and control its citizens in China. But instead of the government using it in this case, it's actually a private company. And they're taking advantage of this technology. Quote, digital rights advocates on Tuesday called for a ban on private use of biometric surveillance technology after a mom taking her daughter to see a Christmas show in New York City was kicked out of the theater after its facial recognition system identified her as an employee of a law firm involved in illegal proceedings against the venue's operator. Kelly Colon was accompanying her daughter and her New Jersey Girl Scout troop on a post-Thanksgiving outing to Midtown Manhattan to see the Christmas Spectacular at Radio City Music Hall, starring the iconic Rockettes. However, as soon as Colin entered the venue's lobby, security informed her that she'd been flagged by facial recognition and that she would have to leave, end quote. So you may really be asking or you may even be yelling well hey alex this is this is a private company they can do what they want at the end of the day if they want to have facial recognition software and for some reason they have a policy saying well no no you are working for a company that is currently litigating us we don't want to give up any information you may be here for fun but you could use something against us. You could go into the bathrooms. Maybe there's a health violation for some reason that could play into the lawsuit. Something something to that effect. And I think that the argument that the company gives in this case is a little bit stringent. It's a little bit, how should I say it, loosey-goosey. But I do understand there is some reasoning behind that. But I think we need to take this to its absolute extreme for you to understand how terrible this could be if we eventually get to a place where this is used everywhere by all companies. So say you go to use your bank and you've said something that's very unfavorable about them in the past. Maybe you dismissed some of their policies. Maybe you said that you didn't like the way that they're governing certain things or you didn't like their... I mean, even in a really extreme case where they have total control over your assets and you have no legal remedy, maybe they say, oh, no, 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 you don't like our interest rates? We saw you out there protesting against us at Wall Street on a security camera, and now your face is in the system. Now we have facial recognition. You're, not, you're no longer allowed to bank here, and we're going to hold a certain proportion of your assets as collateral for you switching banks or something to that effect. Now, there are, of course, legal remedies to that. But for some reason, let's say that those can't step in. This kind of technology, this facial recognition being used by private companies to identify unwanted people, unfavorable people, customers that have violated some arbitrary rule or some policy that was just most recently put into place that they did not inform everybody about, like this woman in New York, that is extremely, extremely dangerous. Imagine that they are able to deny you service just for you being you, for you going about your day or your actions or your activism or anything, just going about it, doing it how you would normally do it, but now your face is out there for some reason. It's associated with a certain message, and then those companies use that facial recognition software to say, nope, we don't want them here. Just think about that. Think about the implications of that. Private industry, in theory, could deny you service for any number of reasons, but it only becomes easier when we can use facial recognition with software that instantly flags you anywhere you go, not just your local branch that maybe you don't get along with that one teller. It could be any branch in your area. It could be any branch in any state in theory. So I just think that it is a slippery slope argument, and it is taking it to an extreme that is unlikely to happen. But sometimes we have to take it out there to actually show how this technology could be used in a malicious way. And we may not get there immediately, but over time, as people become more used to the use of this technology and more okay with constantly being looked at, scanned, facially recognized, placed in certain locations, like, oh, you went to Giovanni's for lunch yesterday? Yeah, we know all about it. We tracked your face all, with all the traffic cams on the way there. As people become more okay with that, companies will be willing, and even the government will be more willing to use that information because people are okay with giving it up. So we have to be very diligent about this. And if, to be honest, I think we should 
get rid of it or at least step in to some degree. I think that at the end of the day, we don't want to, I don't really want the government to get involved too much. I am not a person who says that the government, or at, I should slow down here. I do not believe that we should involve the government in private industry and in the citizens' normal day lives. I think we should limit that as much as possible. I think that intervention by the government is normally not the solution. If anything, we should have people become aware of this issue and protest or not use certain services or companies that have these facial recognition softwares and use their wallets in the marketplace of free ideas and the marketplace of free expression to say, no, we do not want this. And if you have this technology in your company, we're not going to use you. And I think that's a great way to go about it. I think that's the preferable way to go about it. But if not enough people care, if not enough people are willing to do the research and understand where this may be headed and the dangers then I think at some point we should ask the government to step in and outright ban it. Because that is a very, while it can be complicated, at the end of the day, if we can jump on it ahead of time and say, okay, we are banning the use of this software by individuals in, in industry, across different sectors, and even in the government. If we can ban this before too many companies are using it and they are lobbying against the government to have this technology, the better off we are. The longer we wait, the more these companies realize that facial recognition, this software could be extremely useful for targeting certain segments of the population with advertisements. See, if they can see, so you know how you go online and they track your data. Well, imagine that certain companies sell facial recognition data to other companies that build a profile on you. They say, oh, wow, Jimmy went into the diamond store yesterday. Oh, Jimmy went into this store. Jimmy went into a GameStop. And they can build a not only a digital profile, but a real-life profile of where you've been, what you've done, and then sell to you products that may be more preferable for you. And they'll be able to say, okay, well, no, we're not going to sell to Sue Ann Joe because we know that Bobby Joe fits more in our demographic. And that's what they've already done with digital technology. They look at your trends online and they sell to the people that they think they can get sales from. Imagine if everywhere had this facial recognition software and people were totally okay with it and they just started selling this information where you were, what you were doing. And that's extremely profitable, or at least it can be. So before companies start doing this and truly recognizing the power that this software has, we need to ban it before they start pushing back too hard. Then again, that's just my opinion on the matter. I am a little bit biased because I'm a very, very private person, or at least I like to pretend to be. <laughs> and also, I think that we should speak with our wallets, not the government. But if that's not going to work, if people aren't going to stand up and care about this issue, because I haven't seen it get much traction over the last few years, a lot of people aren't fully aware of what they do in China and how scary it is then we need to ask the government to step in. And even if they can't outright ban it, some restrictions are better than nothing at this point. Though at the, at the core of my cores, I don't love the government being able to step in and restrict and ban certain things because then where does it stop? But I think this is a, an issue where I'd be willing to give up my principle of saying the government shouldn't be involved because it also involves privacy. And I value privacy more in my opinion, than the principle that I have that the government shouldn't be involved. Because they're already involved in a lot of things. But there are certain lines I will draw. And, you know, I'm still fleshing it out. In the future, I may have a different opinion. And if I've said something different in the past on one of these podcasts, even though it has only been six months, my perspective while reading all these newspapers and all these articles has most definitely changed in certain areas. And if you want to call me out on it, throw it down in the comment section. I'd love to see if you noticed a change in some of my perspectives. Maybe I'm being flip-floppy. Maybe I'm being oxymoronic in certain cases. And I would love for that to be pointed out as well. Because at the end of the day, I probably have said some things that sound a little bit contradictory. And I would love to know where they are. And if I can come back, listen to them, and sit down, and then say, wow, okay, wow, I am a little bit off-base. Or... I did kind of come from two different angles here. 
then I can kind of sort it out. And if you have opinions about it, if you have comments, throw it down there because I'd love to hear it. This is a podcast about helping people get information as much as it is about self-exploration and putting on record my beliefs and allowing me to flesh them out a little bit and spread them to a wider audience. All right, that's enough ranting. Got a little bit off base there, but I think everything I said was pretty important. All right, our second article comes from Common Dreams. Schumer accused of caving to big tech as antitrust bill languishes. We'll start this one with a quote from the article. Quote, in May, Synergy, Synergy, goodness gracious. In May, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer promised an early summer vote on bipartisan antitrust legislation that, while relatively modest, would take concrete steps to curb the vast power of big tech. But with the end of the year approaching, Schumer has yet to deliver on his pledge. Angering supporters of the bill who say the Democratic leader is caving to Apple, Google, Amazon, and Meta, corporate behemoths that have been lobbying aggressively against the antitrust measures. According to a report released Friday by the Consumer Advocacy Group, Public Citizen, opponents of the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, spent nearly $277 million on lobbying on all issues, giving them a 6 to 1 advantage over supporters, which have spent about $45 million, end quote. And, you know, politicians wonder why people don't like lobbyists and private interests being able to funny money funnel money into politicians' pockets so easily. You can see, I mean, there are other aspects here, and we're, we're going to address them here in a second. But at the end of the day, people are tired of this private money coming in and influencing our politicians. And I think there should be restrictions, or at least some form of restrictions, on lobbying as well. And the author also points out that this is personal for Schumer, whose daughter is a registered lobbyist for Amazon, and his other daughter currently works at Meta. So, in my opinion, I think that Chuck Schumer should recuse himself because there's a conflict of interest on this matter. And honestly, I, I don't blame him for not moving forward because it, he either is going to piss off his constituents who want him to take steps to curve the power of big tech, or he's going to piss off his family members who work for those same big tech companies. They may even get fired because they weren't effectively lobbying their father or at least getting the point across to their father that he shouldn't be passing this legislation. But at the end of the day, I think he should recuse himself. He should choose not to vote. So at least he could say, I brought it to the floor for my constituents, but I recuse myself because it's too personal for me. So then he can possibly protect his daughters as well. And at the end of the day, I say to protect his daughters. He shouldn't have to protect his daughters. He is a public servant. He should care about his daughters. He should look out for his daughters. He should value his family, of course. But at the end of the day, he is serving an American public that has been lied to, has been manipulated by big tech companies, that is constantly giving up their data to them, allowing them to manipulate their search feeds. So he has a public duty that goes beyond his duty to his family, I think, at least. So I think that at the end of the day, he should push this legislation forward. But I do not, do not envy his position, especially with his daughters working in these companies. Quote, AICOA, sponsored by Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, is one of three antitrust bills that have been languishing in the Senate for months, despite attracting support from Republicans and Democrats. If passed, AICOA would prevent tech platforms such as Amazon from unfairly elevating their own products, an anti-competitive practice known as self-preferencing. The Open App Market Act, OAMA, a bill led by Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, aims to rein in Apple and Google's dominance of the mobile app ecosystem, a duopolistic position the companies have used to crush competition and give their own products special treatment, end quote. And, you know, we've seen these app companies go to battle with Elon Musk recently, and dealing, he had a deal with them taking a portion of the cut when he's trying to get subscribers to Twitter Blue. 
so we have to decide whether or not we should allow these companies. And yes, I don't want the government to get involved. I think that, once again, it should be the people saying, no, we're not going to buy your apps. We're not going to purchase in-game through the App Store. We're going to purchase online and transfer it onto the App Store. And I think there's an argument to be made for that. Like Fortnite, Fortnite Mobile, they had a little lawsuit going with Apple not too long ago where people were using the Fortnite store in the app without you going to Apple to buy their products. And the thing was that Apple said, well, it's an app on our app store. It should be an in-app purchase. The way to get around that is Fortnite say, okay, we're going to take you to an external link, not even within the app. We're going to take you to a Fortnite website where you can buy the V-Bucks yourself and then transfer them back onto your account. Then Apple would have a much harder time saying, well, we deserve a share of those profits because it was a purchase made in the app. And I think at the end of the day, there are workarounds, but it's a lot of effort on the public's behalf to actually say, no, we're not going to buy or we're not going to purchase these things in the app. We're not going to give Apple the power. We're not going to allow them to take the profits from the company that we're trying to support here. So at the end of the day, I think that's the way that we should do it. But once again, in, in my opinion, these companies have too much power. And if other people aren't going to stand up and say something and aren't going to agree, then at the end of the day, maybe this legislation shouldn't be passed. Maybe if a majority of people don't agree, it shouldn't be passed. But I cho choose to take the perspective that a lot of people are not fully aware. And if they were aware, then they would want to get this legislation passed or they would go out and do something on their own. So then in that case, I guess that could be technically a justification for having legislation passed in order to do this. I do think it infringes upon a private company, though. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky. But both Google and Apple do have a monopoly over these markets. And at the end of the day, simple measures that break up or at least stop anti-competitive practices and monopolies, I do think that's justified to some degree because it serves the people. At the end of the day, it is meant to allow the people to have more choices, allow for more competition, therefore better products, so on and so forth. So. That's enough rambling about this one. I just really wanted to point out that Chuck Schumer has been not moving forward. He has biases. He has the personal effects that are keeping him from moving forward on this bill. And at the end of the day, I think it's a discussion that we need to have. And, of course, Congress and the DOJ have been having this conversation. Antitrust legislation has been coming down hard. And you know what I find really interesting? The turn of the century in the early 1920s is when a lot of antitrust legislation and concern for the oil and steel monopolies was coming down. And now, once again, coming into the 2020s, we're seeing antitrust concerns about big tech. And I think it has to do with booms in technology in the later part of a century, which kind of lines up nicely. The eight, later part of the 18th century, a lot of these companies were being built up around steel, oil, infrastructure, railroads like Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Carnegie, so on. And then we saw the dot-com boom at the end of the 1900s, as well as we have a more progressive movement in the earlier part of these centuries. Now the question is, will it tail off after these big companies are disbanded a little bit, are cut down to size essentially? And then the progressive movement kind of withers away as they have done their job and they come back at the end of the 21st century. Or are we just going to keep going full progressive town? I'm very interested to see how this plays out. Just looking at historical trends, it's interesting how cyclical things like this are. But that is totally, totally off subject. So let's jump into our third article from Politico. Politico. A battle for the Arctic is underway. And the U.S. is already behind. You see how dramatic that, that headline is? I thought it was funny when I first read it. But they're not wrong. So with global warming and climate change on the mind, many people think about the more intense weather, rising seas, so on and so forth. But what doesn't normally come to mind, or at least in this specific instance, what doesn't come to mind is the changing landscape in the Northern Hemisphere and how new shipping lanes will now be accessible, and how islands will be available to be militarized. Russia has already come to grips with this reality, and they have put large 
portions of populations in the northern area of their country along the Arctic Sea, in military bases, oil refineries, and more. But they're not the only ones. Norway has also been taking steps to improve its position as well. Quote, everything we do is to keep good order at sea. Rear Admiral Ron Admir Anderson, the head of the Norwegian Navy and Coast Guard, told me la last week. He said he's seeing an increase of both international, commercial, and specifically Russian naval maritime activity in the Bernet and Norwegian Sea over the last five years. Anderson says that the Norwegian fleet was devoting new resources to underwater monitoring, aerial shipping lane surveillance, and intelligence sharing with other Arctic nations like Sweden. Quote, we've been improving to make sure we've control over the North Atlantic. What happens now in the North is important. It has a direct effect on security elsewhere, end quote. So the reason Politico is really writing this article is not just to highlight the changing position in the Arctic and of the Arctic nations, but also to talk about an attack on a telecommunications line uh, on Svarbard that connects the world to satellites and GPS arrays. Quote, Svarbard, Europe's most northernmost inhabited island, was just 700 miles north of south of the North Pole, perfectly represents the spirit of cooperation. While a territory of Norway, it is also a kind of international Arctic station. It hosts the KSAT satellite station, relied on by everybody from the U.S. to China, a constellation of dozens of nations' research laboratories, and the world's doomsday seed vault, where seeds from around the world are stored in case of global loss in crop diversity, whether due to climate change or nuclear fallout. Svarvard, where polar bears outnumber people, is considered a demilitarized visa-free zone by 42 nations, end quote. And as the region, region becomes a new center of the new geopolitical reality, there's more attention that needs to be paid to assets in these regions, such as Svarbard. Quote, America is playing catch-up in a climate where they have little experience and capabilities. The U.S. government and military seems to be awakening to the threat of climate change and Russian dominance of the Arctic, recently issuing a national security for the Arctic region and a report on how climate change impacts American military bases, opening a consultant in Nuke, Greenland, and appointing this year an ambassador at large for the Arctic region within the State Department and a deputy assistant secretary of defense for Arctic and global resilience. America's European allies, too, have been rethinking homeland security, increasing national defense budget budgets and security around critical energy infrastructure in the Arctic, as they aim to boost their defensive capabilities and rely less on American assistance, end quote. And this really could change the, the dynamic of the globe. And at the end of the day, we may see nations like Norway, Sweden, Denmark, because of their owning of Greenland, and Canada become even more pivotal parts of the economy. These ports that already exist in most of these countries may become opened up for longer because of climate change. There may be more passable shipping lanes. And at the end of the day, we may see a lot of people move to some of these areas, including a lot of Americans may move to the northern part of Alaska, which is very, very uninhabited, to create lots of different shipping towns, towns that process different shipments, so on and so forth. So this change could be be huge at the end of the day because there have been shipping lanes there but they're only open for a certain segment of the year and imagine instead of having to go around the tip of south america or having to go around the tip of africa which in my mind if you had to go around the tip of africa you probably weren't going to russia or any other nation that would necessarily need you to or would actually benefit from the melting of the ice in the north but it could do a lot to change the situation from the people that would normally have to go around the Cape of Good Hope. So maybe at the end of the day, this will really improve the economies of some of these states. But it also brings up so many military problems at the end of the day. 
and we just need to be ever focused and aware. I thought it was funny when I saw Trump trying to buy Greenland a few years ago, or at least a report that he had thought about it. Yeah, I don't know if he ever actually made the offer. And I was like, oh, silly guy. And as I thought about it, I was like, wait, actually, yeah, I have been reading, or at least I had thought that this climate change, it's, it's going to open up pathways up north, and it's going to make some areas a little bit more friendly towards agriculture and maybe even more important in the military geopolitical battle. Maybe we should have brought Greenland. Now, Denmark also knowing that it'll be very important in the future would not have let it go, or at least not for a cheap price. But uh, it's an, it was an interesting move that I was like, Trump, you may be onto something there. You may be a little bit crazy most of the time, but you, you may have been onto something there. All right, so let's jump away from all this. Not as negative as normal, so I can't normally say my catchphrase, oh, we, we should get away from the negative stuff. But we're definitely going to go to something that's very delightful because it's our daily delight from News 18. It seems that cats have been making more and more appearances in these daily delights lately. And though I am allergic, I can't even deny that they have some cute moments. Quote, interspecies friendships are always a treat to watch, and social media is full of videos that depict an unlikely bond between two animals of different species. Of the numerous videos that go viral now and then, one such video shows an unexpected encounter between a cat and a reindeer. Although the two seem quite friendly at first glance, what ensues as the video progresses will surely leave you in splits. And honestly, the reindeer seems more interested in the cat than the cat does with him, but I guess that really follows suits for cats because they never seem to give me the time of day. Quote, hilarious now viral video was shared on Instagram on December 14th. The clip captures a cat and a reindeer in the same frame. The playful feline presumably tries to befriend the reindeer by hopping close to the latter and scratching at his hind leg. The reindeer startled... <laughs> Have a sudden contact kicks, tries to kick the cat, but misses, end quote. And it is a, it's a pretty funny video, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so if you want to see any of the cute videos or photos or read any of today's articles, there will be a link in the description below that like and subscribe button where you can find all of them. And then also down there is the Twitter handle, at your daily flip. Try to put something up there every once in a while. Uh, links to Monday... Wednesday and Friday to the podcast, so keep that in mind. And with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.